a very rambunctious crowd. This is a rambunctious crowd. Well, hello, Tucson. It's great to be with you. I love, I love this place. We've been very successful here, as you know. And I'm thrilled to be back in the great state of Arizona with thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots. That's why this is a nice group. I like them. Look at all those people. Wow. As everyone saw two nights ago, we had a monumental victory over Comrade Kamala Harris in the presidential debate. We won big with independent voters, moderates, Republicans, and working people all across this nation, putting forward a clear vision to, very simply, make America great again. Meanwhile, Kamala Harris showed up spewing empty rhetoric, the same old lies, meaningless platitudes, offering no plans, no policies, and no details whatsoever, nothing. The two anchors, David Muir and Lindsey Davis, sat there and only corrected me on things where I was right, but didn't correct Kamala on Project 25 that I knew nothing about, on the bloodbath hoax that has been totally debunked, which had to do with the automobile industry that is going to be dying. It's dying under this administration. They're all going to be shipped out to China. And everybody in the automobile industry making, manufacturing automobiles, vote for Trump. We're going to bring back that industry. These people are killing it. She talked about knowing it was all false. She talked about the Charlottesville hoax, and these people did nothing about it, which has been totally debunked, as they say, by Snopes and Snoops and everybody else. Hey, go look it up. Go to Snoops, whatever the hell that is. No, I hear that's a liberal site. And they came out totally in favor of me. This has got to be a bad thing. But they said they gave you total phony stories. Kamala Harris said that no state allows abortion in the ninth month, which is a complete and total lie. They do. They do. And even after birth, in some cases, she claimed, I want to monitor women's pregnancies. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to. It's a total lie. I don't want to do that. Women, I won't be following you around to the hospital monitoring. No, she made it up. She's a liar. She doesn't work at McDonald's. She said she worked at McDonald's, right? Right? She worked at McDonald's, and she was working so hard. There's only one problem. She didn't work at McDonald's. She's a liar. Liar. She claimed that I want to deny people IVF treatment when, in fact, I want to require insurance companies to pay for it. And I came out totally in favor of IVF. That's fertilization for the men in the audience. <laughs> of which we got a lot of tough ones here. She claims she doesn't want to ban fracking when she said repeatedly over a 10-year period, I will not have fracking. Then about a little while ago, she goes, I'd love to have fracking. <laughs> Her pollster came back and said, this is not good. In Pennsylvania, you want to ban fracking, that's not so good. That's a big part of what they do, right? And uh, she came back. She came back. All of a sudden, she thought fracking was wonderful. Here's what happens with all of these things. Right after the election, she goes back to where she was. She claims she doesn't support mass gun confiscation, when, in fact, she supported it entirely. And through her entire career, think of that. She wants to confiscate your guns. Does anybody in the audience have a gun? Raise your hand. Would you mind if this lunatic knocked on your door? Hello. I'd like to take away your gun. Is that all right? <laughs> Especially the women won't allow it. They're not going to allow it. That's unbelievable. 
What is that, about 100 percent of the audience? Let's go. Does anybody in the audience not have a gun? Wait, there's somebody. So if you want to keep your gun, we don't have to go through the rest of it. You want to keep your gun, vote for Trump, okay? I promise. But, you know, she did something even worse than that. You know what it is? She was the leader of a thing called the movement, Defund the Police. How about that? She was the leader of the movement to defund the police. Now, think of it. Anybody that wants to defund the police, that's called she's down and dirty left, okay? That's down and dirty. If she's in there for a week at defund the police, we don't want her to be president. We don't want her for anything, frankly. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she says, no, I never said it. You know, she actually goes around saying she never said it. But we've got like 10 years of tapes where she's saying it, with the guns, with the fracking, with everything we mentioned. She had many years of tapes. But the public was not fooled. They saw right through it Kamala's lies and unprecedented partisan interference of two low-life anchors, their low lives. For them to do what they did, and they wouldn't correct her on like Project 25. I don't know what the hell it is. I purposely have not read it. I could, but I don't want to because they never had my authorization. And for them to allow her to get away with me, everything I said, oh, well, we don't think it's true, like the crime statistics. The FBI didn't report the most crime-ridden cities. They didn't do it. They left out large numbers of areas where they had a lot of crime. So the numbers came in. They weren't up too much. And if anybody in this audience doesn't think there's more crime now, there's so much more crime now, but they gave false and fraudulent numbers. They did it with something else. 818,000 jobs. Think of it. They said they had 818,000 jobs that didn't exist. So your jobs numbers look better, but now they had to do. What happened is they were taken away by a leaker. Usually I don't like leakers, but I like this particular leaker, whoever it was. But when a prize fighter loses a fight, you've seen a lot of fights, right? The first words out of that fighter's mouth is, I want a rematch. I want a rematch. And that's what she said, I want a rematch. Polls clearly show that I won the debate against comrade Kamala Harris. And as you probably know, because, you know, when you say Harris, does anybody know who Harris is? No. Kamala is a very Different kind of a word. Nice name. Very nice name. But you know her as Kamala. You don't know her as Harris. When you say Harris, everyone says, who the hell is that, right? But she immediately called for a second debate, which means that she was like a price fighter that lost a fight. We had two debates, though. I had a debate with Crooked Joe Biden, right? And I had another debate with her. She and Crooked Joe have destroyed our country with millions of criminals and mentally deranged people pouring into the USA, totally unchecked, unvetted, and with inflation bankrupting our middle class, it has gotten bad. Everyone knows this and all of the other problems caused by Kamala and Joe. It was discussed in great detail during the first debate with Joe and the second debate with Comrade Harris. She was a no-show at the Fox debate. You know, Fox invited her. She was a no-show. I sat with the great Sean Hannity. Does anybody know Sean Hannity? Good man. He's a good man. And I said, where is she? She didn't show. So we did a town hall. And he got great ratings on that town hall, I'll tell you right now. Got really great. Led all of television for the week. It's not bad, right? Simple town hall turned out to be uh, it turned out to be a town hall from what it was supposed to be, but she didn't show up. And refused also to do NBC and CBS. She went over to ABC, which, in my opinion, has taken a big hit, because these two people were bad news. They kept screaming at me. I said, why are you screaming? I'm saying to myself, I'm looking at him. I always liked him. I'm not going to watch him anymore. 
I'm not going to watch him because he's not legit, what he did. I'm not going to watch him. And his hair's not as good as it used to be, you know? Kamala should focus on what she should have done during the last almost four-year period. She kept complaining, well, you know, when I'm in, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And at the end of the debate, I said, why don't you just do it? You could leave right now. Why don't you do it? I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do this and that and that. Remember at the convention when she went out and they nominated her, even though she got no votes, they nominated her. No, she came in last place in the primaries, right? And then she got, and then she said, Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. No, she's a threat to democracy. She is a threat to democracy. But do you remember when she went out and she said, thank you? Do you remember that? It was the weirdest thing. Am I wrong? Because they were saying, JD and I are weird. No, we're very solid people. She's weird. And that vice president of hers is really weird. He's really. That was a sound bite. You know, they said, uh, oh, he's weird. That was, in other words, they gave it to their friends in the fake news, weird. It's something I've never called. I've been called a lot of bad things, but not weird. But you know, she went out and the people were applauding and stuff. And she goes, thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 I think she went nuts. There was something wrong with her. But I was very happy because I got the endorsement of the vice president's family. And I got the endorsement of the vice president's brother. And even sent me a contribution. And and I was very happy because uh, Barack Hussein Obama, his brother, as you know, endorsed me. So, no, his brother endorsed me. That's not easy. Now, he, uh, so we have the endorsement of President Obama's brother. We have the endorsement of the brother of the future vice president. He better not win. If he ever won, this country will be in bad shape. It's already in bad shape. Three and a half years of what they've done to this country, especially, look, we're laughed at all over the world. We would have never had the Russia-Ukraine problem. We would have never had, we would have never had October 7th, Israel, the attack on Israel. None of these things, and we wouldn't have had inflation. And we wouldn't have had that horrible, the way we pulled out in Afghanistan was so horrible. None of those things would have happened. We would have had a much different country. And we wouldn't have 21 million people in our country right now that shouldn't be here. That I can tell you. So because we've done two debates and because they were successful, there will be no third debate. too late anyway. The voting's already begun. You got to go out and vote. We got to vote. We're going to, this is going to be the most important vote in the history of our country. It'll be the most important. People said that I was angry at the debate. Angry. I was angry. And yes, I am angry because he allowed 21 million illegal aliens invading our communities. Many of them are criminals. Many are criminals. I'm angry. I'm angry. USA! USA! They said he's an angry person. No, they're destroying our country. I don't like she's you know, she's smiling, all practice, right? Did you see her? She's like a we're talking about a border invasion, the likes of which no country has ever suffered. And she's like this. <laughs> but I am angry about Venezuelan gangs taking over Aurora, Colorado. And illegal Haitians, and he came in, illegal Haitian migrants taking over a beautiful place. It was so beautiful.
Springfield, Ohio. I was there. I campaigned there a while ago. Springfield, it was so beautiful. Now it's just what a place. Can you imagine you have this small little community? All of a sudden, you have 20,000 illegals in your community. Nobody knows where they come from. I'm angry about young American girls being raped and sodomized and murdered by savage criminal aliens. I'm angry about rampant inflation destroying our middle class, and the American people are also very angry about that and every other thing that we've had to endure for three and a half years. That's why 54 days from now, we are going to tell Harris that we've had enough. Our country can't take it anymore. We're going to go, Comrade Kamala Harris. You've done a horrible job. You've been the worst vice president in the history of our country. You had no chance of getting this position. You shouldn't have had it. You got no votes. Whether you like Biden or not, he got 14 million votes. He had none, not one. We're going to go, comrade, you're fired. Get out. Get out. Get out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, thank you. Wasn't The Apprentice a great show, though? Wasn't it? Do you think if I didn't do The Apprentice, because that's a big question, because a lot of people in Hollywood are blaming themselves for this. They're saying, if we didn't do The Apprentice, he wouldn't be. But you know, they all vote for me, you know that, because they want to pay low taxes. They talk about, no, we don't like Trump. But when they go to vote, they go, anybody watch? It's true. They want low taxes, no crime, great schools, strong military. They don't want a border invasion. They don't want people pouring across the border illegally from prisons and places. So they go in, they say, yeah, no, no, I'm not for Trump at all. I will never vote for him. Then they go in. So. It's true. And then they go out and they do exit polls. And you know, in 2016, and, and 2020, where I got many more, millions more votes, by the way, I hate to say that. They say, oh, that's a conspiracy theorist. No, it's called, I got more votes than any sitting president in the history of our country. And they said we lost. I was told if I got 63 million votes, which is what I got in 2016, you can't lose. Just get 63. I got close to 12 million more votes than that. And we lost, but we didn't lose. What, what a, and we're never going to let that happen again in this country. We're never going to let that happen. We can't let that happen again. But when they had exit polls 2016, and they said, oh, he's getting killed in the exit polls. And I remember NBC and that stupid ABC that did this horrible debate. Those two people should be fired as an anchor. A couple of more years, they'll be fired. And she was nasty. She looked at me with hatred in her eyes. And him, he's a nice guy. I mean, they were told to do it by George Slobodopoulos, who's, who's in the group, right? George Slobodopoulos. But, but on the exit poll, so people are walking out, and they're saying, uh, you know, I uh, would like to know something, sir. Who'd you vote for? And they'd say, uh, crooked Hillary or Trump, right? But so many of them, like almost 50%, said, none of your business who we voted for. They have a tougher word, two words. Not like Biden, one word, and then he gives two. Two words. They begin with the letters F-U. That's what they say to the people, F-U. I would never say them because we have a lot of young people here. My audience have gotten, they've gotten younger and younger. Do you notice that? Younger and younger. 
Don't worry, I still like the old people the best. I don't care. I don't care. Let that cost me, all these young people. Let that cost me the election. I like the, I still like the old people the best. Got to stay with the people that got you there, right? I love the, what we're doing for the old people, you'll hear. But it, so that was the two words, but I don't want to use those words. So they said, none of your business, which is not really what they said. And they walked out and everybody said, Trump is finished. He's got, he's not getting the numbers. He's, because in the past, nobody said that. They'd say, I'm voting for this one or that one. There were no people that wouldn't say, you know, they'd just say who they voted for. So what they did, thank you, darling, thank you. So what they did, you know, she keeps saying, I love you, I love you, right in the middle of my punchline. She keeps... <laughs> so, so they always say one or the other. And I had one analyst who was very smart, but I was called by Fox, this person in Fox, sir, I'm sorry, sir, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. And they say, this is 4 o'clock in the afternoon, because, you know, they've, interviewed all these people. And another one would call me. They all said, oh, they were actually happy. Most of them were happy. Some were really sad, though. A lot of the people were really sad. So it came out, this is going to be a very short evening for Donald Trump. They were so happy. Martha Raddatz was actually crying at the end when I won. She was crying. You don't think she's biased, do you? Martha Raddatz, also of ABC. ABC is the worst of the group, by the way, I have to tell you. They're all bad. But the worst, the worst is ABC, and they prove that with the stupid worst, the worst two anchors anybody's ever seen on this thing. They were the worst. At least they shouldn't have been so obvious, right? You know, Libby. So anyway, so I walked out, and the people walked in, and I, I was getting calls that they, you know, thousands of people all over the country. I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then one guy calls me up, who's a political, brilliant guy, and he said, uh, sir, and you know, I, I went, actually, I went to see, I, I don't think I've ever told this story, I went to see our great first lady, and I said, darling, you know, I got home, I got home from Michigan, I was in Michigan last stop, and I got home from Michigan at like four o'clock in the morning. I had a rally, we had 42,000 people at at 1 o'clock, I did seven rallies. I started in Florida. I went from Florida, where it was 88, to Michigan, where it was 20 degrees below zero. I said, if you don't catch a pneumonia in this business, you're never going to catch a pneumonia, right? But I went to our great first lady, and I said, darling, and I felt okay. It was amazing, because, you know, the athletes, they say, I left it on the field. I left it all on the field. Said, well, I did, because I did seven major uh, rallies for two days. Seven each. Who the hell can do that? People were saying nobody else could do it. You think Biden could do it? I don't think so. I don't think Biden would do seven. I don't, I don't know if he'd do one. He'd do one that would last for about three minutes. Now, we did major rallies, you know, speak for an hour, hour and a half sometimes, go to the next day. We got all up and down. We went off everywhere. But this one guy calls up. So everyone had called me. I had a young gentleman in my family came to see me. Sir, uh, you haven't lost, but it's not looking good. This is at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Election Day, right? And I said, it's all right. Don't worry about it. So I went to see my wife, and I said, you know, I don't feel the way I thought I'd feel. I thought I'd be, like, devastated. But I left it all out, and if we don't make it, but it looks not good. She said, does it look like you're not going to win? I said, it really looks that way. And uh, we'll get by it. It's one of those things. But I was very disappointed. But uh, I just felt it wasn't like, gee, if only I worked a little bit harder. Because humanly, you couldn't work harder. Then about 5.30, I get a call from a political, very smart political guy. And he goes, sir, I'd like to uh, congratulate you. I said, on what? He said, you won this election. And I said, what do you mean I won the election? I was told by every pundit that I lost the election. He said, no, you won the election. I'm 95 percent sure, because we've never seen so many people leaving an election that said, it's none of your business, <laughs> right? Meaning, you know what? It's none of your business. We've never seen that before. 
a massive number, like almost 50 percent. Who do you vote for? None of your business. He said, every single one of those people belong to you. They're our people, whether we like it or not. And, and he said, you're going to win Florida, you're going to win Georgia, you're going to win all these states. I think you're going to win because, you know, normally it would be like 5 percent, 10 percent might say it. You've got 50 percent. There's never been anything like that. And I believe all those votes are your votes. I said, well, all right, good. And then all of a sudden they came out and the rest is history, right? The polls closed. And they started with Donald Trump. So Florida closed at 8 o'clock or whatever. And it, within like seconds, seconds, it closed. Florida polls have closed. Donald Trump has won the great state of Florida. Donald Trump has won the great state of Georgia. Donald Trump and went all the way up the East Coast, all over the place, and we ended up winning. That was quite a day, wasn't it, though? And then we did much better the second time, much better, much, much better. And then, uh, but this is going to be the time because we've never had the enthusiasm that we have now. We've never had it. Because, because now you see how bad they're doing. You know, you see how bad. Before, you didn't really, there was nothing to judge, right? Because I was the president, we did great. We had a great economy. We got hit with COVID, which is China. And, you know, people, people didn't really think in terms of that. It was a terrible thing. But we got hit. The whole world got hit. The world, $62 trillion and millions of deaths all over the world. We got, the world got hit. Everybody, uh, Abi in Japan was uh, devastated by it. So many people were devastated. Good people, very good people. Great people, actually. But what happened was amazing. And now they see how bad a job they've done. Think of it. The inflation, the economy is terrible. Everything's terrible. We're not respected in the world. A war that would have never happened with Russia and Ukraine started. A situation in Israel would have never, ever happened. Never, ever happened. And that's a disaster. The whole Middle East is blowing up. Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, said, uh, you got to bring Trump back or this whole world is going to blow up. So, so we're going to uh, we're going to do things. But I, I will tell you. So, uh, sixteen was great. Twenty was better, and this one blows both of them away because we've never seen the enthusiasm. Like, look at this crowd. We've never seen the enthusiasm. That we have. So I'm pleased to be joined this afternoon by the next senator from Arizona. And we're going to call her a different name. She may be angry. I haven't told her this. But she may be angry. She may never speak to me again. But I'm going to give her a different name. Because, you know, she's very strong on the border. She knows the problems that you're having in your state. Arizona's got tremendous problems with illegals coming in from all over the world and just pouring in and, you know. By the way, taking Hispanic jobs taking African-American jobs, taking people that have been here a long time, citizens, taking the jobs. But she's been very strong on it. And I just realized, because it's gotten so bad, when you look at Springfield, Ohio, when you look at Aurora in Colorado, where the, the governor has no, I feel so sorry for this guy. He has no idea what to do. He's a Democrat, so you know. <laughs> he has no idea what to do about it. He's devastated. He's afraid to do anything. But if you look, the Venezuelans have taken over. I mean, and they walk in with guns, the biggest guns that I've ever seen. They had guns that were supreme. They call them supreme guns, AK-47 supreme. They, are, they have stuff. I don't know where the hell they get this stuff. They come in. They've taken over buildings. They're in the real estate business, let's put it that way. And, and that's just the beginning. It's going to get really bad, okay? And, you know, you have a sheriff with a deputy or something, and you got... 30 guys with AK-47s and all these horrible, I mean, big stuff. And they're taking over. And it's not, let me tell you, we're not letting it happen. This woman is very strong. She's running against a weak person. She's running against a guy who voted 100% of the time when he was voting. He voted 100% of the time just about for crooked Joe Biden. 
He's weak in the border. He wants to have open borders. And he's going to go back to that. I don't even know what he's saying now. It doesn't matter, because when they're for open borders, they're never going to change. It's, they're stupid people, because it's going to ruin our country. But she's tough in the border. So if you don't mind, I'm going to call her Border Carrie Lake. From now on, it's Border Carrie Lake. <laughs> She's a fantastic person. I've known her a long time. I was one of the early people that endorsed her. And I'll tell you, she is tough, tough, tough on the border. And, you know, that's taken over. I think in 2016, I won maybe because of the border. I don't know, the economy, the border, whatever. But a lot of it was. But the border, and I fixed it. And in 2020, I couldn't talk about the border. My people would say, sir, you're wasting your time talking about the border. I say, well, wait a minute. I fixed the border. I want to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear it. You know, once it's fixed, nobody wants I made that border so strong, and I couldn't talk about it. But let me give you the bad news. That border was one one-hundredth of what it is now. That border was, when, when I took over, it was bad. But it was just a fraction of what now it's horrible and dangerous, and we're ruining our country. We're destroying. So Carrie told me that she's going to be focusing on the border, 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 right? And, and she is — you're going to get it fixed, right? You're going to get it fixed? And she's going to get it done. She's tough. She's tough on the border, though. It bothered her from, from the first day you started having the problem. She would have done it as governor, and that race was a very sad race, because she did great. But she would have done that as governor. But she'll do it even more so, in a sense, as senator. And she'll fix your border, and she'll be working with me on doing it. Border carry leg. Thank you. Thank you, Border carry. I don't know. I'm giving her a tag. You know, when I give people tags, it stays. But that's a good one. She's going to be great. She's, she'll be a great. And the guy, honestly, he is nothing. This guy that's running, he's, no, he's got nothing going, and he couldn't care less about the border. You need help. You can't let this happen. Also, a candidate who's a great person who I endorsed, he's, uh, was, he just did a fantastic job of everything he's done. Now he's running, as you know, for Congress. He's doing really well. Won in the primaries, tough races. Run, won in the primaries. He's something. He's somebody that really seems to be able to get the job done, like very few people that we all know. But Abe Hamaday is here someplace. He's a tough cookie. He's a tough cookie, and I can, I can really name him border also, but how many names can I use? But you're a big border guy. You want to see a strong border, and uh, you'll win on the border. You will and Carrie will win on the border. You don't have to talk about anything else, because everything else we'll fix. We'll take care of the — we'll bring your interest rates down. We'll do everything, but you'll win on the border. If you guys just focus on that, you don't have to talk about much else. There's a man that's going to help you a lot on the border, too. He's a fantastic friend of mine, Art. Del Cuello, Border Patrol, the head of Border Patrol. Where is Art? He's a good guy, too. He's been my friend, along with a couple of our other friends, that for a long time. And, you know, they endorsed me uh, years ago, and they've never taken it back. And I saw that Art and his people go on television. They say, there's only one man going to be able to do this border. And uh, I appreciate it, Art. We won't forget it, Art. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank everybody else, too, Art. Appreciate it. And Arizona Republican Party Chairwoman Gina Swoboda. Gina. She is great. She is — she is a winner. Thank you very much, Gina. And all the — I'd like to thank all of the police I met backstage and Border Patrol people, ICE, 
ICE. That's great to stand up for him. They go through a lot. That's great. Look at that. Look at that, Art. That's great. And they deserve it, too. You don't know how much respect we all have for you and the job you do, and it's dangerous work. And you know, they want to really do the job. They're stopped from doing their job. They want to do their job. They want to work. It's more dangerous. It's harder. But they want to save our country. These people are incredible, I'll tell you. As the people of Arizona understand better than anyone else, under Kamala Harris, our country is under a thing called invasion. Did you ever hear the word invasion? Just like a military. It's like a military invasion. We're being conquered and we are being occupied by a foreign element. And, you know, if you think about it, China has a five million man army, mostly man in that case, I can tell you. But they have a five million person army. And we have 21 million people coming this year, this, this period of time. 21 million people over the period of the last few years. Think of it, they have a five million, that's a big army. And we have 21 million people here, so cut out half. That means you have 10 million people, and they have guns. You just see that if you look at Colorado. Take a look at Aurora. They have guns that are the most sophisticated guns anywhere in the world. High-powered stuff. And, you know, you say to yourself, so if you cut the number in half, 10 million people, and cut that number in half, 5 million, that's the size of China, and what they have is an army. It's pretty dangerous stuff. We got to get them the hell out of here. As discussed in the debate, not only is Comrade Kamala allowing illegal aliens to stampede across our border, but she is flying them here from other countries. Remember, she said, no, no. Remember when their polls were crashing a few months ago, she said, oh, 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 and they issued some order art. I don't know what it was, because it stopped it a little bit, slowed it down a little bit, but it doesn't mean he knows. He's laughing. He knows, because they'll slow down a little bit, then they'll say, oh, look at the numbers, but they have a problem. They didn't include the airplane numbers. They fly them in by the tens of thousands. Think of it. They're trying to say they're into the border, and yet they have airplanes, beautiful airplanes, going and picking them up and dropping them into the middle of our country, where I would say that the states — it means we really have 50 border states. No, they're dropping them into the middle of our country all over the place. They fly them in. Think of that. They fly them in by jets. They're, they're, take, they're flying in all the time. And, Art, they don't count those numbers, do they? They don't talk about them. When, you know, when they fly in — and then they have a special app, right? They have an app where the cartels are allowed to use the app to get their people in. Do you believe this? It's an app for cartels. So the illegal cartels that are among the richest people in the world, by the way — you know, we think we have a lot of wealth. Well. Take that 400, the Forbes 400 or whatever it is. Forbes isn't doing so well anymore. But take whatever the hell 400 they have. These guys would qualify. In many cases, they'd be a hell of a lot richer. The cartels are using this app, think of it, to bring thousands and thousands of people here illegally. Over the past three and a half years, Harris-Biden administration has resettled a half a million illegal immigrants from the failed state of Haiti, which is a totally failed country, very sad situation, into American communities, including over 200,000 who Kamala has illegally flown into the United States by airplane. Think of that. And they're coming out of Haiti, and they're coming out of other failed countries at levels that nobody has ever seen before. In addition to Aurora, Colorado, there's a place called Springfield, Ohio, that you've been reading about, 20,000 illegal Haitian immigrants have descended upon the town of 58,000 people, destroying their entire way of life. This was a beautiful community, and now it's uh, horrible what's happened. Enrollment on the state's Medicaid and food assistance programs have soared. Motor vehicle accidents have skyrocketed. Recording of 911 calls even show 
residents are reporting that the migrants are walking off with the town's geese. They're taking the geese. You know where the geese are? In the park, in the lake. And even walking off with their pets. My dog's been taken. My dog's been stolen. This can only happen. These people are the worst. This is, I'm telling you, Biden and Kamala, this is the worst combination in the history of our country. We, the only one happy is Jimmy Carter, because he's no longer referred to as the worst president in history. Not even close. Likewise, a small 4,000-person town of Charleroi, Pennsylvania. Have you heard of it? Charleroi. What a beautiful name. But it's not so beautiful now. Has experienced a 2,000 percent increase in the population of Haitian migrants under Kamala Harris. So, Pennsylvania, remember this when you have to go to vote. Okay, just remember this. 2,000 percent increase. This is a small town. All of a sudden, they got thousands of people. The schools are scrambling to hire translators for the influx of students who don't speak not a word of English, costing local taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the town is virtually bankrupt. This flood of illegal aliens is also bringing massive crime to the town and every place near it. Earlier this year in Massachusetts, one of the Haitian illegals who Kamala flew into America was charged with raping a 15-year-old girl and badly, badly hurting, hurting that girl. Also in Massachusetts, a Haitian migrant was charged with raping a pregnant woman and beating her very badly. Yet another Haitian migrant who she imported was arrested for molesting a 10-year-old child who lived right next door. The child next door was badly, badly hurt. In New York this year, an illegal brought in through Kamala's migrant phone app was charged with savagely murdering his two roommates. He had two roommates set up by the people that set that up in this country. Welcome. They go, welcome. What would you like? Oh, I'd like to have a nice room. Okay, we'll give you two roommates. Viciously stabbing them to death. But these are just a few of the many, many stories. There are hundreds and hundreds. There are thousands of stories. They're coming in from all over the world, from prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums and many tourists at numbers that we have never seen before. You've never seen these numbers before, Art. You never saw these numbers before. Have you? You've never seen anything like this. This is unique, at least with you. It's unique. We cannot let this happen to our country. It will not end well unless Donald J. Trump is elected the 47th President of the United States. Thank you. All right, we'll get them out. We'll get it ready. We'll bring back our country in many ways. That's one way. But to me, that's like one of the most important ways. Well, we'll also stop World War III. That's an important way. There has never been an invasion like this in any country. There's never been an invasion like this. There's never been a border like this. No matter where you go in the world throughout history, there's never been a border like this. And the fake news media will correct me if that's the case. I'll tell you what, there's never been anything like what's happening to our country in history, because no leader of a country is as stupid as the two people that are leading our country. In fact, our leadership, if you think about it, is non-existent. I mean, where's Biden? Do you, think he, do you think he lies awake at night, turning and tossing on finding a way to stop the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine? I don't think so. He hasn't spoken to Putin in years. I will get that war settled as president-elect. And I'm telling you, this is true. Kamala, a committed Marxist, you know, her father's a Marxist professor, 
will be far worse than crooked Joe Biden. He's, she's going to be worse because he doesn't really believe it. She does. She does believe it. And she'll go back to no fracking and all the other things we talked about. She'll go back to them on day one. But on day one of my administration, I will stop this invasion. I will seal the border. I will end the Harris migrant flight. And I will begin the largest deportation operation in the history of our country. We have no choice. Thank you. Thank you. We will not allow our country to be destroyed. They're destroying our country. We will get the criminals out, and we will not let them back into our country. We're not going to let them back in. They're staying out. You know, the other countries are doing this. You know that. And this is all over the world. This isn't just South America. This isn't Honduras alone. And Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico. This is all over the world. The Congo in Africa comes. A lot of people coming from the Congo. But Africa, they're coming. Asia, the Middle East, and South America. But they're coming from all over the world. And they're coming from prisons, and they're coming from jails. We're not going to let this happen to our country. Another terrible effect of the Harris migrant invasion, and she's the one that wanted it more than Biden. Biden didn't know what the hell was happening. He said, oh, that sounds like a nice idea. <laughs> is that it is driving housing costs through the roof. You know that, right? You're affected by that. Fewer than 5 million new houses were built in the last three years, yet Kamala Harris has imported 21 million illegal aliens who are now disproportionately occupying lower-income rental properties. So think of it. We built 5,000 units, 5 million units. We built, think of this. They started in a little community where they did 5,000. That was quite nice. Then they go to 5 million units, but we have 21 million people came in. None of them are going to be paying a lot of rent, I can tell you that, because a lot of those people are people that shouldn't be here. Some should, but a lot of them are people that shouldn't be here. As just one example, a vivid one, Look at the explosion in rent in Springfield, Ohio, where Kamala has resettled the 20,000 Haitians. There's a chart up here someplace. I don't like that as much as the chart that I had in Butler, PA. That was nothing. That was my favorite chart. Now, that was my favorite chart. We still have that. That was a great, beautiful chart. The, the red, the yellow, right? And the blue. That was my all-time. That is going to be my all-time favorite chart. I don't care what chart I look at over the years. I will sleep with that chart every single night. But look at, look at the numbers and look at the way those lines are. They're totally out of control. When I return to the White House, we'll we will require that all companies receiving federal housing subsidies to verify citizenship. We're going to verify citizenship. We're going to make sure that it's a legal residency. And as a condition of their rental agreements, they're going to have to do all of it. Taxpayers will not subsidize apartment rentals for illegal aliens, and we will not permit illegals to drive up the cost for Americans in need. In addition, I will ban all mortgages for illegal aliens. You can't have it. Now, in California, under Gavin Newsom, you know, they want to give illegals mortgages. They want all illegals. How about all illegals get a mortgage? You don't get any mortgage, they do. This is the first part of my plan to restore housing affordability in America. Kamala Harris is killing the American dream, but with your vote this November, it's going to be the most important election 
ever in the history of our country. We are going to bring back the American dream bigger, better, and stronger than ever before. Going to bring it back. Under my leadership, we had the greatest economy in the history of the world. Before the pandemic, we raised real median household income by $7,684, a record per family. We achieved the lowest Hispanic American unemployment rate and the lowest Hispanic American poverty rate in the history of our country. And Hispanic American household wealth and home ownership reached the highest level ever recorded. Thank you very much. I like you. But now Arizonans are experiencing an affordability crisis, and this is a crisis of historic proportions. Do you agree? You know that. You know what's going on in this area in particular. Today, not a single major city in Arizona is considered affordable, not one. When I was president, nearly two-thirds of the homes in Phoenix were considered affordable for families making the median income. Think of it, two-thirds, and now it's none. Today, the number of homes that are affordable for those middle-class families is down to a number that you don't even want to hear. It's almost like nothing. Here are the other pillars of my plan to end this nightmare and help millions of Arizona families afford the house of your dreams. We will rapidly reduce inflation by slashing energy costs. We're going to slash energy costs, taxes, and we are going to slash regulations. By quickly defeating inflation, we will, in turn, bring interest rates down very fast. When I was president, interest rates were hovering around 2 percent. You got a mortgage. Oh, look at that guy, the big guy. Stand up. Look at his shoulders on him. You got a mortgage at around 2 percent. That's right, you. How many people have a Who's Who else looks like that? Nobody going to mess with him, right? <laughs> Nobody going to mess with that guy. But he was happy when I said, the low, you got a good mortgage. I can see a lot of other people did. Today, the mortgage rates are at 10 percent, 11 percent, 12 percent. You can't get the money. We're going to bring it down very fast. We're going to bring energy down. We will drive down the rates so you will be able to pay 2 percent again, and we will be able to finance or refinance your homes drastically at much lower costs. You do a refinancing or a financing if you're looking. This step alone will save Arizona families between $800 and $1,000 per month on their mortgage for a typical home. Under comrade Kamala Harris, your electricity bills here in Arizona rose an estimated almost 100 percent. It's the largest increase anywhere in the country. Did you know that? Congratulations. You're number one in the — oh, that's right. That's not good. No, congratulations. You're number one in the country for the increase in your electric bills. What the hell is going on? As President, I will end the Harris-Biden war on American energy on day one. And under my plan, it is my goal to cut your energy costs by 50 percent in the first year. 50. 50 percent. Remember, we have more liquid gold under our feet than any other nation in the world, more than Saudi Arabia, more than Russia. We will slash the cost of heating, air conditioning, gasoline, electricity. And by bringing down the price of energy, we will defeat inflation and reduce the prices, which are through the roof right now. People can't afford cereal. You got to see, it's so sad when you see people being interviewed and they buy three apples and they walk away from the cashier and they bring an apple back because they can't afford it, and it happens all the time. Upon taking office, I will also sign an executive order directing the immediate termination of every single unnecessary rule that is impeding housing construction and driving up the costs of housing. Government regulations are responsible for more than 25 percent of the cost of a new single-family home and 40 percent of the cost of multifamily homes. Think of it. Regulations costing 40 percent of the cost, and it takes you years to get it done. We're going to end all of that. I have been a builder my entire life. I understand the problem, and I will fix it. I know how to fix it. Nobody else is going to figure it out. 
My objective will be to cut the cost of building a new home by 30 to 50 percent, and much of it is regulation. And in addition, we will open — and this is your great — your great people in the state that are asking me so many times, so many people are asking me to do this. We will open up new tracts of Federal land for large-scale housing construction so that we can get housing on the market. About 18 percent of all land in Arizona is owned by the Bureau of Land Mismanagement. <laughs> it's actually management, mismanagement. I have to be careful, because, you know, with the fake news media, I can go a whole speech. I can go a whole speech, stand up here largely without a teleprompter. I don't read them most of the time. But — because you'd, you'd find it very boring when you read teleprompters. Run, spot, run. Remember I said that? But I could go a whole day. I could go stand up here, talk to you for two hours. If I mispronounce one word, like I called mismanagement, I said the Bureau of Mismanagement. Well, I was kidding. They won't say that. They'll say he's cognitively impaired. No, it's true. Watch, that'll be all over television. Sarcasm, for me, is the worst thing possible, because when I'm being sarcastic or say something kiddingly, like even the other night, I was talking about how much we won by a certain election a few years ago. And I jokingly said, we won by just — they won by just a little smidgen. Is it true that you think the election was close because you said just — I said, yeah, I was being sarcastic. It's not good. When I imitate Joe Biden not being able to find his way off the stage, which happens all the time. No, it happens all the time. I get decimated by the fake news media. And sometimes they say, look, he can't find his way off the stage either. You have these stages, they have like four or five stairs, usually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, is this a government-owned building? They have more. They have usually more stairs. But when I do an imitation of that, they will sometimes say, because I called up our great First Lady, I said, how great was my speech tonight? Because it's — they're always on television. You know why? Because they get good ratings. I said, how great was my speech tonight? Did you see the size of that crowd? Oh, and by the way, her crowds are zero. Her crowd, she's got no crowds. They bust the people in. They pay buses to bring people. Nobody here rode in on a bus, I guarantee you that. Unless you own it. I said, did you see how great my speech was tonight, darling? How great? She said, well, it was good. I said, uh, what do you think? Well, I didn't like your hair. Oh. I said, what else? But the people were going crazy. They loved it. Well, yeah, they might have, but you looked really bad. You couldn't find the stairs off the stage. I said, I was imitating that guy. But this is the fake news media, just like these two fakers that were up this weekend. I think they really hurt their career. I really believe that. I think they hurt. I hope they did. Finally, I will save America's suburbs by protecting single-family zoning. The radical left wants to abolish the suburbs by forcing apartment complexes and low-income housing into the suburbs right next to your beautiful house. Right next to you have a beautiful house, and they want a nice low-income building to be right next to you. I will end this Marxist crusade. I did it, you know. I did it. Five, six years ago, I did it. Uh, the suburbs were safe. That's why when they say suburban women maybe don't like Trump, I think they're wrong. I think they love me. I do. I never had problems with women. I never had any problems. But they say suburban women. So they live in the suburbs, and I'm the one that says you can't build a low-income apartment house where people want to do harm when they move in, right next to your beautiful little house, right? And then I hear the women don't like me. The women want strong borders. They don't want to be hurt, molested, killed. They want their family to be safe. They want a strong military, so we're not going to be attacked by anybody. Peace through strength. So why wouldn't they like me? Those are the things that I stand for. They want good education. And I'm for choice. They also want choice. Choice is a big thing in education. To get even more relief to American workers, I will massively cut taxes for working families, and we will 
have no taxes on tips, no taxes on Social Security benefits. No taxes on tips. You remember a few months ago, I announced there will be no taxes on tips. A couple of weeks later, she goes, I'd like to announce that there will be no taxes. On well, why didn't they do this before? In the meantime, they are putting in legislation to make it impossible for these people to avoid paying taxes on the tips. So I don't know what they're going to do, but I think it was a little bit of a copycat, you know, a little bit of a copycat. And also, very importantly, no taxes on Social Security benefits for our seniors. That's a big deal. I don't know. Maybe that's even a bigger deal. But I have a big one coming up. So you have the privilege of being the first to hear this, because I'm also announcing — and you remember that, seniors, when you go to vote, you go to vote. Because you know what? You've been eaten alive by the stupid inflation caused by energy and caused by their overspending foolishly, their stupid spending. The Inflation Reduction Act, they call it. And then they said, well, it was a lie. It was really part of the Green News scam. Okay? Remember that? They said it was a lie. It was a massive spending, trillions of dollars, and it caused inflation, but it also was helped, inflation, by their stupid energy policy. And just so you know, they're doing about what I was doing, but that was four years ago, five years ago. I would have had it quadrupled by now. They're doing the same thing as I was doing many years ago, but they had to. They were cutting it like crazy. They lost Anwar, the biggest site in the world that I got, Ronald Reagan couldn't get, nobody in, in Alaska. And they went out and they — it was terrible. Remember the first part where the, it was $5, 6 it was going through the roof? And he said, bring back the Trump plan. What did they do? So they got those rigs going again, and we had sort of similar numbers. But mine would have been four times, maybe five times higher by now. And what they have is they're just steaming along. And let me tell you, if they won the election right after the election, they're ending all fossil fuel. You're not going to have any. And you're going to find out what bad living is. Today, I'm also announcing that as part of our additional tax cuts, we will end all taxes on overtime. You know what that means? Think of that. Think of that. Think of that. That gives people more of an incentive to work. It gives the companies a lot — it's a lot easier to get the people. And, you know, I went to some economists, great ones, and I said, what do you think? They said, it would be unbelievable. You'll get a whole new workforce by doing that. No taxes on overtime. The people who work overtime are among the hardest-working citizens in our country. And for too long, no one in Washington has been looking out for them. Those are the people. They really work. They're police officers, nurses, factory workers, construction workers, truck drivers, and machine operators. It's time for the working man and woman to finally catch a break, and that's what we're doing, because this is a good one. And I think it's going to be great for the country. So that's why we will be saying that if you're an overtime worker when you're past 40 hours a week, think of that, your overtime hours will be tax-free. Okay? Good. You're going to have it, too. And unlike Biden, where he tells you that you don't have to pay your school tuition and uh, he gets rejected, then he goes again and again, it's been — now it's totally gone. Or as they say in politics, it's debunked. It's gone. Uh, that was terrible. You know, he kept saying to these students, no more loans, no more loans, which was very unfair to the millions of people that actually paid off their loans over the years. Some of them took 20 years to pay them off. But but that's a dead deal. That's totally dead. You know, they tried to revive it two weeks ago. That didn't work out too well. That's a totally dead deal. But these will be three things that will get done. So if you think about it, no tax on tips, think of that. Think about this and the Social Security for our seniors. Because the seniors have been destroyed by inflation. It's unfair. And this is like a whole new life for them, because you're talking about a lot of money. So no tax on Social Securities for our great seniors.
And this last one is no tax. You work your ass off. No tax on overtime. And that's so good for the employers. One of our economists said, I think that's actually going to bring money into our economy. You know, when I cut taxes, we had the largest tax cut in history. And when I cut taxes, with a much lower rate the following year, we took in more money than we ever took in with a much higher rate. People, the jobs, people work by a lot. But this is how we will end the era of inflation, mayhem, and misery under the Kamala and Crooked Joe regime and unleash safety, prosperity, and peace for Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. Together, we will deliver low taxes, low regulations, low energy costs, low interest rates, and low inflation so that everyone can afford groceries, a car, and a beautiful home. We will stop the invasion and end migrant crime, support our police, strengthen our military, build a Missile defense shield over our country. Much of it will be made right here. Ronald Reagan wanted to do it many years ago, but we didn't. Honestly, we, we're lucky we didn't because we didn't have the technology. Now we do. You see in Israel how it works, and we're going to have the biggest and the best. We make it. We're going to all make it, and a lot of it's going to be made in a place called Arizona. Is that okay? We will keep critical race theory and transgender insanity out of our schools. It's amazing. It's insane. You know, that always gets, like, the biggest applause. It's, it's like a poll. You're like a pollster. You're like a free poll, I must say. No, but you are. It, it always gets the biggest, because can you imagine your child goes to school, and they don't even call you, and they change the sex of your child? Think of it. And you know who the leader of that whole thing was? Kamala. Kamala. And another one that gets a big hand, and it's, it's crazy. We will keep men out of women's sports. How simple. How simple. How simple is that? Did you see the Olympics recently? It was pretty good. But they had the prize fighters, the fighters. And they had the women's fighter. They now have women's boxing. That's a big step, but they have women's boxing. And yet, this beautiful young woman from Italy, and she was fighting against a man who transitioned. And there were two of them that transitioned. There were two of them that transitioned. By the way, shockingly, both happened to win a gold medal, okay? The two transitioned men won. But the woman from Italy, she's up, and she's a good fighter. And she's up, and she wants to win, and she's going to show that we can take this man or woman, this transitioned person, they say. I said, what do I say? They said, transitioned person. And I said, fine, I'm going to say that. But she's going to show them. And he goes, for those that don't, like, know much about the, the left, is just sort of a little defensive. Boom. She didn't know what happened. She pulls away. They thought, what happened? She's not. Then she gives it another try. And he goes, boom, with the left. Not the right. This is the one that really hurts, right? Boom. And she goes, I've never been. Then she quit. She walked off. That was the end. She didn't even go there. She just walked off. She said, I could, I could never stay. I, I've never been hit like that. Then the other fighter, the same thing. So you had two transitioned people fighting. They both easily won gold medals. The greatest is the weightlifting, though. A record that stands for 18 years. And they put an eighth of an ounce here and an eighth of an ounce here on the big barbell. And they got women that are so strong. And this one was going to break the record, and she went up with that thing. She got it, and her parents are right there. And they're going, come on, darling. My wife hates when I do this. She says it's so unprecedented. 
She's got a great style. No, she goes, do you have to do that thing with the weightlifting? It's so, but people like it, right? Should I do it or not? I tell her that. I tell her that. I said, people love it, but she gets it up here. The parents are right where you're sitting. These beautiful women up here. The parents, mom, dad, they're so proud. She gets, come on, baby, you can do it. <laughs> you saw it. Uh. Boom. Can't do it. She couldn't get it up. <laughs> then a guy comes up. They ask him out stage, have you lifted before? Not much, no, just sort of started. And he said, oh, well, good luck, sir. I mean, ma'am. <laughs> and he goes up. He looks down. <laughs> Give him a gold. How crazy is it? Or the swimmers, how about the swimmers? You have the greatest swimmers in the world. They want to win, they want to compete. And this one young lady, All-America swimmer, they're all sort of All-Americans or close. And she looks left and she sees young ladies that she's been growing up with because, you know, they meet the top of the peak, right? The top of the peak, the best. She looks left and she sees five young ladies that she's grown up with in California and other places. She looks to the right, she sees four, and this person next to her who's gigantic. Looks like Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain on steroids. And she looks up. She's never seen anything like this, but she's okay, because she's like top. And she's gonna break that record. She's gonna break the Olympic record. This guy had a reach that nobody has ever seen before. So he gets in and he jumps in, they jump in, they jump in that pool, and she's swimming like crazy. And as you know, you probably heard, they had to take her out. She was seriously injured. You know what injured her? Wind burn. He went by her so fast <laughs> that she suffered massive wind burn. Very serious problem. He won by a lot. In fact, he was having lunch while the other young ladies were coming. <laughs> He was enjoying a nice lunch as the rest of them were swimming in. How demeaning to women, right? Demeaning. How ridiculous. How demeaning to women, like they have wrestling. Stand up again. Will you stand up? Right there. You with the Trump. How the hell could a woman Is there any woman in this audience that wants to take this guy on? <laughs> All right. No, I love that guy. He wears it. Anybody wears a Trump shirt? I like that guy. He looks, he looks, he looks okay to me. We will defend the Second Amendment, restore free speech, and we will secure our elections. Everyone will prosper. Every family will thrive. And every day will be filled with joy and opportunity and hope. But for that to happen, we must defeat Comrade Kamala Harris. I use that term because you know what that term means, right? Communist. She's a Marxist, communist, fascist, socialist. She's not actually a socialist. She's gone past that. Remember, I used to say, America will never be a socialist country. Actually, they skipped past socialism. They, they started at communism. We must stop her country-destroying liberal agenda once and for all. So get everyone you know. You got to go vote. You got to get people to vote. Because we want to get a landslide that's too big to rig. You know, if we have the big votes, they can't rig it. They try. They're the, they're the most dishonest people. We want to go too big to rig. On November 5th, we will save our economy. We will rescue our middle class. We will reclaim our sovereignty and restore our borders. And we will always put America first. We will take back our country. Arizona, thank you very much. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.